how awful Paul is. <laughs> I would delete it straight away. A coat of arms, armorial bearings, ensigns of armorial, whatever you want to call them, consists of several different parts. But the main part is this, which is the shield, not the crest, as people constantly get wrong. This is the shield, and no coat of arms can exist without this. And it is unique. No two people or organizations can bear the same shield at the same time. It is, if you like, a visual identity of your name. Um, names, of course, can be repeated. But a shield cannot be. This is the crest, and it normally sits on top of the helmet, on top of the shield, but not everybody, every organization needs to have a crest. It's everything after the shield is, as it were, um, optional. Some more optional than others. Some not optional, but uh, there are restrictions on them. So this is the helmet and crest. This is a complete achievement of shield and supporters. The keen eyed of you will have noticed that the shape of this shield is different from the shape from the slide two ago. A shield does not have to be what we call flat iron shape. A coat of arms is basically anything enclosed within an outline which is describable in heraldic terms. So these are actually the arms of the University of Strathclyde. The University of Strathclyde is based mostly in central Glasgow, and they specifically said they wanted to change the shape of their shield when they were granted supporters, oh, probably about 20 years ago now, um, so that their signage with their shield on it would look very different from the signage of the other university in Glasgow, the University of Glasgow, which is very much older. The arms are completely distinct. I don't think anyone who'd seen them would actually muddle them up at all. How did it all start? It all started by the need in an illiterate age for people to identify documents. Seals were how they started. The, this is the arms of um, Heath, Marshals of Scotland, no longer uh, are the Earls of St. Thor, Earl Marshals. But this is his shield, legend around the outside, so anyone Seeing that on a document would know it was the real thing. They didn't really go in for seal forgeries in those days. That had somewhat changed. Organizations, people connected, and this is where we're moving into the clan bit, connected with the name will have similar arms. The borough of Peterhead, the borough of Stonehaven, both in Peterhead. Their arms very much based on the arms of the chief of the name of Pete. But you can see subtle differences between them, perhaps a bit too subtle. that Somebody wouldn't necessarily remember that Peterhead had a green base, whereas Stonehaven had a blue base, and that there was a coronet in the arms in the shield, uh, crest of Peterhaven, but not in the crest of Peterhead. But they're both quite old arms, been around for a long time. So where do we get our information other than from seals at an early period. This is the earliest Scottish roll, uh, 1335, failure roll, the arms players of the day, mid 14th The king and then the chief nobles of the day. And that's uh, an extant armorial of 1335. But people think that Scotland was a funny little country stuck on the northern edges of civilization, and nobody would have any interest at all in Scottish heraldry and the such like. This is a 14th century armorial by a Belgian, what would now be called a Belgian, man from the Low Countries called Delra, and his armorial consists of several pages, in the case of Scotland, three pages, of the arms of the individual 
countries, kingdoms, dukedoms, and whatever of the 14th century. Uh, these are the two pages. The style is very low countries, Germanic in the way it's painted, perhaps not surprising, but very, very clear. Again, starts out with the um, King of Scots, but with a nice little twist in that you see the mantling, the bit that comes down the back of the helmet, in the case of the King of Scots, shows the arms of his family. He was a Bruce. And so those are the arms of Bruce. So showing precisely which dynasty of King Gelra was talking about. How do we things are used? Uh, we have a series of armorials from a bit of a dearth in the 15th century, uh, not much until the middle 16th century. Both of these armorials are mid 16th century. And they show, as you can see, the arms of the chief, the elephant. And it just shows a different style. They're both about contemporary. Um, within probably a decade. And you can see the difference in style. You can also see the sight difference of the Scottish artist in that um, elephants aren't terribly common wandering around the countryside even then. But dare I say it, these are a little bit better than the coat of arms that has two rhinos for supporters. Because equally the poor artist had never seen a rhinoceros. And when asked what it was, he was told, well, it's rather like a pig wearing a suit of armor. That's precisely what he painted, was a pig wearing a suit of armor. So he was slightly more understanding of what an elephant would have looked like. The, the two roles prior to 1672, and I'll come back to that later, there are two roles which are alphabetical as opposed to done in categories. Most armorials are not alphabetical at all. Some of the old ones do go in categories in the order of peers, but after that, there is no particular connection, although some geographical connection, some of them sort of concentrate on fife families and then on Celtic families and so on. There are two, this is called Gentleman's Arms. It's dated probably from around the end of the 16th century, the other one is a, an memorial called the Hague Roll, which by its name is fairly obvious it's in Holland now. There was a long debate at long stage. One of my predecessors as Lion Clark was fairly convinced that this was the first armorial that was prepared in obedience to an act of parliament, the act of parliament of 1592. I, of course, was told that by him, so I thought it was true too. I didn't know about the Hagar Memorial back in 1975 when I started in Lion Office. But having compared the two at some depth, I actually think probably the Hagar Memorial was the one that was prepared in 1592 by, or not physically by, but on behalf of the then Lord Lion to temper, which is a Scottish word for being in accordance with an act of parliament. But here you can see the um, two elephant arms. Um, elephant of who's that? But that's obviously a cadet of the main line got a, a yellow in grail border. It's pro probably, it's not an elephant uh, designation I've come across elsewhere. So, but I'll, I'll look into that, Roddy, and see if I can. Um, the one with the marked it, I don't know. And I suspect the compiler didn't know because there's no territorial designation. Yeah. I'll, ha I'll have a look in, uh, see whether the Hagar Memorial says. 1672, the public register of all arms and bearings in Scotland was established by Act of Parliament. It is an Act of Parliament that is still in operation today. It's not a very long act. The major 
sections of it are very simple, hence the fact that it still works in the 21st century as well as it did in the 17th century. It is now 350 years old. It runs to actually probably, I, I think I read the other day, that the frontispiece of the 96th volume has just been executed with uh, the Queen signing it in recognition of the 350 years of the register and her platinum jubilee. The first volumes of the register are just text. Everyone was given a year and a day to hand in their arms. That's an extended five years. And purely because the poor land clerk of the day did not have time to write everything down. The information is pretty minimal. Um, here you do have that Lawrence Oliphant of Gask was a second son of Lord Oliphant. So you get that, and but for the Master William Oliphant, Calquia, you don't know genealogical information. He came along, he said, this is me, this is my coat of arms. Lion of the day accepted was his coat of arms and put it into the register. But it's there, it's lawful, and nobody could come along afterwards and say, that's my coat of arms without producing some pretty pretty firm evidence. There are very, very few entries in the register that have been removed. Sixteen seventy two. Well, between sixteen seventy two and sixteen seventy eight. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. See, his difference is a sand coil between, between the crescents. No, and unfortunately, it doesn't tell us. And the information, even in the other ones, is very often just descended of a second son. So it doesn't give you a pre precise genealogical tree, which it would now. Every generation would be meant, but not at this stage. So here, um, on the, just down, down the road, are the um, two of the modern recordings, relatively modern recordings of um, oliphants. And you'll all be very aware, of course, that all oliphants have a red shield with white crescents and things then individual to mark out a particular line. Um, and that is what makes the Scottish system unique in that the name, the surname, governs what your basic shield will be on the assumption, the old assumption, that anyone bearing that name is connected in some way to the main line, either through blood or allegiance or um, having taken the name because they were tenants on the land or whatever, but they are connected into that. And that is why heraldry very much supports the clan system uh, as we know it today, clan and family. I said earlier that no two people could have the same coat of arms at the same time. That extends even to a father and heir. The heir will have, oh sorry, can I go back? The heir will have a three-point label. You can see the cadency marks at the top. That is a temporary difference it shows that they are not yet head of that particular family. Younger sons have to have a difference that is permanent. Daughters, similarly, have a difference that is permanent. The two arms on the side of a family called McCann, and you can see that one of the younger sons, he, his fess is jaggedy, and a daughter has got a mullet, red mullet on the cheek. And those are permanent. And that means that for a, an experienced herald, I mean, I will look at a coat of arms and say, ah, that person must be descended from a second son of a fourth son of a third son because of the cadency marks that are there 
and they are applied in a distinct order. So you look at them and can work out where everybody ties in. There are several ways of differencing. These two people call kid. At first glance, they are very similar. But actually, Albert George Kidd is not a descendant of John Proctor Kidd. You see he's got two protea flowers on either side of his tree, and he himself is either a second son or descended of a second son. From my memory, it's his father who is the second son. But, so, but you can look at them and know that they both must be called Kidd because they have the same basic underlying code. Now, there is a misnomer that a, everyone in Scotland can use the land anthem. No, they can't. The only person who can use the land anthem is the sovereign. And when acting on behalf of the sovereign, certain great officers are responsible. But only when they're acting on behalf of the sovereign. There is also an assumption that somehow a lion rampant is uniquely Scottish. It's not. Lions rampant are probably the most common heraldic symbol you will find throughout the heraldic world. Of course, the original heraldic world was most was only Europe, but it appears in the royal arms of a significant number of current and former kingdoms and is found in the heraldry of many, many different families from all over Europe. Nothing significant about a land rampant that makes it Scottish. What does make it Scottish in the sense of the royal one is a double treasure of fleur de lis. Um, said to be taken from an a long association between Scotland and Wales, and that early on wanted to somehow reinforce that connection as France was obviously one of the major European areas. And the connection goes on. I'm, I'm giving a, a talk at the end of the month in Stirling, uh, uh, the Kirk of the Holy Rood, on the 29th of July every year. That something to do with James VI, who was crowned in the Kirk of the Holy Rood on the 29th of July when he was five days old. Um, they didn't put the crown on his head, they put it on his top. Very sweet. Um, but looking at this, I've been working quite a lot on Marian heraldry, heraldry of his mother's reign, and the connections between Scotland and France are so very, very closely intertwined. It's not just a couple of royal marriages. There are endless marriages between Scots and um, French people, and there was a thing called the Garde Écossé, which was a specific guard of archers that served the King of France. But lands rampant appear in Scottish heraldry, just like elsewhere, and here are the arms of four chiefs, all of whom have a lion rampant. The top one with the swans, David Weems of Weems, he gets very, very uh, Weems the Weems, now my friend, gets very upset about people thinking, oh, well, I can use the land rampant provided I take the double treasure. And then he rings up and says, somebody else is using my coat of arms. Um, but there are four chiefs with lands rampant in their arms. The bottom one is the arms of Moncrief of that ilk. Uh, one of the interesting situations Serene Moncrief, that is the chief of the name, and a great, great, great herald, married the Countess of Errol, who was chief of the name of Hay. And their elder son was called Hay, their second son was called Moncrief, and their daughter also called Hay. And this is one of the occasions, now there are another one, where you have two brothers who are chiefs of distinctly different families. The other ones are the Kincaid and Lennox, where you've got a brother and a sister who are chiefs of different families. Because to keep the chiefship alive, they designated that one would represent one family and one would represent the other. Uh, the thistle is said to have um, become the Scottish flower due to the Battle of Larg, when a whole lot of Norse people stood on it. Well, they may well have been running around the beach of Larg with no shoes on, but I think it's slightly missing but it did become the main symbol of, uh, the floral symbol of Scotland and was eventually what was given as the name to the premier chivalry 
Star Wars ordens, not the, the order of the Sith. Originally, the order of the unicorn or the order of the planet. But it became and is recorded in volume one of the public register as the national flower of Scotland, along with the greatest of the Scottish kings in 1722, by which time there was one monarch for three kingdoms. And so the rose for England and flax for Northern, what well, flax flags are now for Northern Ireland, were designated as the royal badges and the national and these appear in the arms of the badge of the Supreme Court. Unicorn, the other great um, Scottish beast. And it, again, probably has more connection with Scotland than elsewhere. But originally, of course, it was came from Asia Minor. Theseus gives it a wonderful description where he describes it as having a red head and a blue eye and a multicolored horn. And um, it's normally shown as a white head of gold. There's a wonderful, wonderful series of tapestries called um, La Dame à la Licorne, with a copy in the um, cloisters in New York, which is one in France. And this is talking about the taming of the unicorn. But it has become very significantly um, connected with, with Scotland. Um, and I have a great natural affection for, for unicorns. The, the story behind the unicorn is that it was very pure, it's a symbol of Christ, and that it could only be tamed. Well, Ian Moncrief, who was unicorn herald, unicorn person, may have had a slight um, vested interest in that he said it could only be tamed by a lovely damsel laying her head on the side of the unicorn. Um, so he may have had a slightly vested interest. He was very fond of the fair sex. Um, but it, it certainly could only be tamed by being very gently subdued, being a symbol of Christ and gently um, as Christ being killed. The theory behind it is that the lion is a beast of great strength, ferocity, uh, power, and the unicorn shows the gentler side of sovereignty, listening to people doing the best for your, your country people. So that, that's the sort of balance between the, the lion and the unicorn. Now, the English royal supporter is a lion. So now the royal arms of the United Kingdom have a lion and a unicorn as a supporter. Reversed in Scotland from the way they use the England justice to be a lion and be a king. National flag. The story, of course, about African Ford and whatever. We've all seen planes in the sky with the vapor trails crossing. So I didn't have airplanes when this was made. So maybe, maybe it was just too lots of um, cloud or whatever. Uh, I had, I'm afraid, a fairly strong word with one of the deputy presiding officers about 10 years ago to say that I, as a loyal Scot, was appalled that the Saltar had been hijacked by a political party to promote their own ends, to the extent that if people saw a Saltar on a car or a Saltar on a flag, they were deemed that they must be nationalists. And that was depriving at least 50% of the country, if that was the right figures from the last vote, of use of their own national symbol. He was gracious enough to say that he entirely understood probably not a lot to be done now. But it is unfortunate because you are instantly deemed to be a nationalist if you fly this flag on your flagpole. I do fly one occasionally to annoy one of our neighbors who is a very senior, <laughs> a very senior Tory peer. Um, I was given nine years ago for my birthday that everyone should always wear two flags cost me a fortune in flags, if we could move on. But it is used a lot to show pan-Scottish organizations that are either organizations that represent the whole of Scotland or have a Scottish-wide remit in some form or another. 
uh, one of Her Majesty's ships, Caledonia, which I think is shore based, um, but that the name gives that to it. And the Royal Dick Beck, a Royal Veterans College in, in Scotland, one of the leading colleges. But it's only used in that way for something that is a Scottish organization that is not used in the personal arm of individuals. We had a bit of a problem with Sean Connery when he wanted to get arms in that um, he wanted to have a salt club, he wanted to have a golf club, he wanted to have a pallet, he wanted to have an Oscar, uh, he wanted to have a dog and the dog changed, the breed changed until eventually I said to him, but why don't you have a Scottish dog? And so he thought that was a good idea, a Scottish dog. Um, uh, but we had to come up with a sort of some way of having the salt club without having but we managed. Two Scottish organizations of, of, from abroad, the St. Andrew's Society of Sao Paulo and the St. Andrew's Society of Bangkok. And they come to Scotland to get arms because although land's jurisdiction does not run to either uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil, or, or to um, Thailand, as a specifically Scottish body, they can come and get a legitimate coat of arms to show that they are connected in some way to Scotland. Chiefs of and knights of the highest ranks of chivalry can have supporters, and here are slightly more modern elephants for your own chief. Um, supporters are not, they are a very high honor, and they only go to uh, chiefs and knights of the senior knights in the civil recorders. Um, the present Lord Lyon has slightly extended that. Um, I find my, that a little uncomfortable for me as the way I was brought up with heraldry, but he has tried to um, broaden the range of people who have given significant service in some way to Scotland, but are not either a chief or a knight grand cross. And it is a nice way of recognizing somebody who's done something very specific, but has not, for whatever reason, been elevated. These are the arms of Oliphant of Rossi. Uh, in the, if you held your barony, which was a piece of land that was erected by the crown into a area for um, judicial control by an individual, if you owned your barony from uh, 1594 and were still in owning the barony, you could seek a grant of supporters. Now, in the case of um, Oliphant Rossi, these arms were recorded in 1722 with the supporters. Uh, and then that goes on. The chapeau above the shield, which is blue, shows that they don't actually still own the barony. If they had a red chapeau, they would still own the land. Very, very few people still own baronies that were granted to them back in the 16th century. There are one or two, but not many. But baronies went on being erected for quite a long time, but baronial supporters ceased uh, once their role in Parliament was over. So the, this is quite rare for baronial supporters. Clergymen technically were deemed not to be combative and therefore didn't have a helmet or crest because many clergymen were marry, have children, and want to hand on the whole thing to their their offspring, as did this clergyman here. He had his own shield with a uh, clergyman's hat, clerical hat, but he also recorded a crest to be passed down to his heirs so they could go on using it without having to re-record. We don't particularly expect people to re-record arms that they inherit, not if they're just they under the more than once every third generation or 80 years or so. You only would re-record if you're a younger, younger child. So um, my elder son has not matriculated arms as long as he's alive. My second son has because I'm an heraldic heiress in two senses in that I'm the end of my father's line and I'm also the end of my mother's father's line. So I did matriculate him so that my arms and my mother's continue to go down. My daughter's getting rather nobs, but she has a lot of arms. 
when I'm richer. Because there is no helmet and crest. A motto goes below if there's no helmet, goes above if there is. The arms of the Royal Borough of Dundee um, support us for the, for, for the major uh, organizations that are created by Act of Parliament or have a royal charter. So the Borough of Dundee was obviously existed long before Act of Parliament, but it was confirmed as the Borough of Dundee by, by several parliaments. And they have these wonderful, wonderful Ivan supporters. So you will see supporters on corporate stuff. Academy. They get a canton of the Royal Arms of Scotland, which they can apply for. It has to go to the Queen. The Queen herself has to say whether they will get it. I and cannot give a canton of the Royal Arms of Scotland without a warrant from the sovereign. And it would only be to very significant bodies, learned bodies, who are in receipt of a royal charter. No, it, uh, organizations can have a helmet. It's a funny thing called a salic. Um, uh, but many, many, many organizations merely have a crest. They don't have a helmet on the head, but they are entitled. And that's why the motto then is above, because they have a helmet. Arms of organizations don't always make it entirely individuals abundantly clear what they are. The arms on the bottom here are for an organization called the Rhetorical Company. And it is speech, silence is gold, speech is silver, silence is gold. And it's a rather, I think, convoluted way of talking about the fact that they are a company. The arms on the other side are for a man called Irving, who uh, was one of the major researchers on Halley's Comet. So this is meant to be Halley's Comet. I try always to avoid having anything too personal in the shield because the shield will go down for generations. And the fact that you are a fine astronomer doesn't mean that any of your descendants will be fine astronomers. And so, so if it's in the press, it is always possible for somebody to come along and say, I absolutely loathe astronomy. I do not want to have Halley's Comet in my press. What you, say? you can change your press. You can't change the shield. Um, but there are obviously occasions there are people who perhaps have been Families of, um, we have some of the been families of coal miners on both sides for seven generations. Then it seemed appropriate to put in a symbol that signified their long association with coal mines. So you take a balance. I was rereading this morning, um, very briefly, a paper that I gave a long, 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 long time ago to an interna international conference about modern symbolism. Um, but one of the things you grapple with at Perry is how do you symbolize modern things? So it's torches are fine for schools and books are fine for schools, but what about online teaching, digital home learning or whatever? And this is an educational body, but the third symbol in the base is a representation of a computer chip. Um, to try and explain, you know, this is a modern thing. But you then have to discuss this with all your heraldic colleagues around the world. Because we all know, all of us, all around the world, uh, what a torch and a book mean. But will they all get that that is a computer chip? Um, so we have a quite interesting discussion. We have an um, international conference every year and goes to different parts of the world. And we have quite interesting discussions about how you're going to symbolize the most modern thing. I did say to a, a friend of mine when he was chief herald of South Africa, why they only use books in um, 
the arms of uh, educational establishments, to which his rather wry reply was, torches are used to burn schools down. These are two of my very favorite quotes from Marcus. Next one. On the right, a man called Brown, and on the left, a man from Australia called Bailey. They were both the archetypal little boy who wanted to be right. And they wanted to have something to show that they esteemed so much. But how do you, you can't just put the front of the Royal Scots on the Scott on the, uh, in the blazon. The blazon has to describe, the words that describe a coat of arms have to tell every single artist who reads them, or every single herald, what the visual image is. So it's no good saying on it, or crest, an emerging royal Scot. There's no artist in South Africa or Italy or Denmark or whatever is going to know what that meant, what it is. So you put um, a roundel with a panache of feathers which symbolized the distinction. Um, and they were both very pleased. And Mr. Brown's brother was so pleased with the coat of arms, he came back and said, well, I never wanted to be a train driver. I wanted to be a postman. So I now want to have my crest with my lion holding something symbolic of post, which indeed he did hold. How do you signify occupation? In some subtle way that will be not too in your face. Um, on the left, a pianist, a Campbell coat of arms. This is it's so difficult to distance because of the way it's composed of this thing called gyroni, um, but you can have a fest showing piano keys. Uh, I was particularly proud of the one in the middle in that this was devised for a, a dear, dear friend who was a very, very good philatelist. And he wanted something that would signify philately. He had no children. He wasn't going to marry, so the arms were going to be for him and him alone. And we came up with this fest that looked like the bit from the edge of a stamp. And what was even nicer was the English kings of arms then went and adopted it for the coat of arms of another great friend of mine who's been stamped for it. And the company, a company on the side, oil, uh, they're called McGee Oil. And the drops of, on the um, griffin's wings are drops of oil and the oil, black and gold of oil in the bottom. So you can sort of what the company is without saying too much. Heraldry has to be used. It is not just a pretty thing. Now, I use it a lot because I've got these wretched flag poles. So I have to buy flags. Um, but how else is it used? Now, you'll be more than familiar from your travels about stained glass in churches and cathedrals, but stained glass that tells a story. The arms on the right are actually from the Great Hall of Edinburgh Castle, and they show the arms of two Lords Lion. The arms on the left-hand side are the official arms of the Lord Lion. The arms on the right-hand side are the personal arms of Lindsay of the Neck and Gilmore. The middle one at the bottom is taken from St. Giles Cathedral, the Preston Isle. The banners of the Knights of the Thistle hang in the Preston Isle, and there is stained glass behind with, with heraldry in it as well. At the top, in the middle, the Jaguar, that is a crest for Lord Steele of Akewood, Sir David Steele, who's the presiding officer. Uh, he is a Knight of the Thistle, but he is also something like the President of whatever, the Jaguar Car Club. And so he had a jaguar as his, as his crest, but it's used. The bottom of the mace of the Lord Lion showing the arms of the donor. So forever, if anyone says, who gave that? It can be turned up, and there you can see by a man called Sir Campbell Gray, who was lion mace. Very, very and one of the nicest ones 
is you're lucky enough to meet the Palace of Holyrood House with the Lord High Commissioner for the General Assembly each May. You might be given one of these printed chocolates with the royal arms. But heraldry should be used. It shouldn't be just sitting on a bit of paper. Now come to the last couple of slides. The chief of the Lindsays, the, uh, the coat of arms of the Lindsays, a rather novel way of using your heraldry is found in parterres and gardens and used in great houses across um, Europe. You will find little um, box hedges cut into the arms of the family or the owner of the house or in some way. And at Edsel Castle, the next slide, see round the edge in the wall are symbols of the fest checky of the chief of the Lindsays, and the motto is cut, clipped out in the box hedges around the side. So not everybody has the opportunity to do that, but it does show that anyone going there who knows anything about heraldry will say the Lindsays must some because otherwise, why would that coat of arms with that motto? Because the coat of arms is, is in black and white, monochrome in the garden, so it could be Stuart or Clark who both have fest checkers as well. But the motto then tells you it must have been passed um, in some way along connected to the Lindsay. That's a quite a scamper to Scottish heraldry. I haven't touched on heraldic language, um, lots of other areas I haven't touched on, but um, I hope it's given you a slight flavour and shows you why in Scotland, heraldry and the clan system are so intertwined because of the connection with the name. And so anyone who is called Oliphant who gets a coat of arms in Scotland will have their arms based on the arms of Only if you are in the jurisdiction of the Lord Dyer. So if you are not a British subject or subject of a Commonwealth country that does not have its own heraldic authority, you would not be able to get it. I'm afraid. But if your surname is Oliphant and you did get a coat of arms, it would be based on the arms of Oliphant. But not if your surname is not Oliphant. You can't use his coat of arms for any purpose at all. You can use his crest within a strap and buckle. Um, the chief has it in a plain circlet with his motto. Clansmen have it within a strap and buckle, which they can wear as a badge or a brooch to signify their allegiance to their chief. There are no restrictions on having a plaque of the arms of the chief to display in your house out of loyalty, but in each instance, it would be as a mark of your connection to the chief. His coat of arms is his personal property and therefore cannot be used in a personal sense by anyone else. So you couldn't, for instance, put it on a bookcase inside a book, fly a flag if it was on a flag post, because that would be saying, I am the chief. Yes. And I mean, in Scotland, it is a legal system, and there is a procurator fiscal who deals with heraldic matters, who will write and say, sorry, no, you can't do that. Well, <laughs> with a three point label, I hope. <laughs> so I hope that gives you an idea and keep so when, when you're on this wonderful trip that um, Roddy has devised for you um, so keep your eyes open heraldry is actually everywhere even if you don't particularly notice it go down 
from A9, see the sign for Perth? The arms of the Royal Borough of Perth on the sign. So they're, they're all, all over the place. So I hope, hope that's opened your eyes. And there's quite a lot of heraldry in, in North America, too. Great question, great question. And where do you take them now? Oh, oh that's... Miss um, Condi, Rossi. Oh, um, I'm useful to know that's how it's pronounced. Um, well, it, 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 there are lots of different types of yeah. and the key of Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you.